Hi everybody, my name is Jordan Lloyd and today I will be doing an extensive look into the Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity, along with some of its more well-known arguments and analogies used to explain it, as well as exploring some new ideas brought up by others and myself as well. I will also bring into the light some downfalls and oppositions and I will finally conclude my piece with some overall final thoughts. Alrighty, so for starters, a basic definition of the Holy Trinity would be that it is a traditional doctrine observed and followed by Christian religion, basically stating that there is one God who exists as or in three equally divine persons. These three persons being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, obviously, we're looking at three different figures here. So, we're looking at the Father figure who sent his only begotten Son, which we know better as Jesus Christ, which is the second figure, and the Holy Spirit, lastly, who is surrounding us and always with us and sort of unending and that's the third element. So you're probably asking yourself, all right, well, how can this be? How can we have three divine persons in one, all coming together to be God himself? And that's what we're going to get into. I think a really important point to make before we get into deep discussion about this is that there is three main components and points made of the Trinity. Um, number one being that there is exactly one God. Uh, number two, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Number three being the Father is not the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. So to go off a little bit from that and put that in more generalized terms, there's one God and all three of the divine persons are God and, you know, they're not each other. So the Father's not um, the Holy Spirit, this Holy Spirit's not the Son and the Son's not the Father. So it's really trying to drive home that they are three independent divine persons yet there is exactly one god and they all are god individually and together let's start with something called the nicene creed the nicene creed is a creed in which most contemporary christians look to for a somewhat um, officialized expression of what the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is really trying to say and what it means. It's a more revised and somewhat explanatory version of its ancestor document, the Creed of Nicaea. It's written in Greek and uh, translates as such. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the life giver, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is together worshipped and together glorified, who spoke through the prophets. All right, so that was the creed and explanation, if you will, um, that majority of Christians use and refer to when thinking of uh, a way to explain or justify the mysteriousness and complexity within the doctrine of the Trinity itself. And for us, that might be a little bit too complex, especially if we're not um, familiar with the Trinity and its components and everything it has going on. And I think there's some good ways that we could look at the Trinity 
and try and understand it better. And I think a really good way to do that is with analogies. And and an, one analogy in particular I'd like to look at and discuss today is the Cerberus analogy. So what is the Cerberus analogy exactly? Well, for starters, let's talk about what Cerberus himself is. In Greek mythology, there's said to be a three-headed dog uh, who's standing guard at the gates of Hades, and that's Cerberus. You may think, why am I comparing God to a mythological dog? Well, just as Cerberus has three heads, but is still one dog named Cerberus, God as well has three divine persons and yet is indeed one God. And with both Cerberus and its three independent heads, and God with his three independent divine persons, these centers of consciousness could possibly come into conflict due to having independent cognitive abilities and such. And this may be where we run into a problem with this analogy. However, despite the diverse mental states that both Cerberus and the three divine persons may have going on, we have to remember that Cerberus is indeed one dog, and God is one God. Remember, one of the main points of the Trinity is that God is exactly what he says is one God. Um, And, you know, Cerberus isn't three dogs, and God isn't three gods, but more so three heads on one dog, and three divine persons within one God. And I think that's really the most important thing to remember when considering the Cerberus analogy in a generalized state. Alrighty, so although I personally think in comparison to other arguments and analogies that the Cerberus one um, might make the most sense without um, it being as hard to believe because both seem a bit unlikely yet mysterious. Um, There are other analogies and arguments used to try and understand the Trinity. And one of these analogies um, used by early theologians to understand the doctrine of the Trinity and all of its elements was the social analogy, in which the three divine persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were compared to three human persons. And these three human persons are in a family. So a family of a mom, a dad, and a son, or however you'd like to set that up. And how they're all part of a family, just as the three divine persons are all part of God, yet they still have independent cognitive abilities, although in the social analogy, they also have um, independent physical abilities because they are their own person. There are also downfalls of this one, um, just as there are with most of the um, analogies we use to try and understand the Trinity. I think with the social analogy, it doesn't necessarily make as much sense to me and I believe that this is because they are individual people and although the the three elements of the Trinity are separate yet one in a family that's kind of different because you have your own body you have your own physical abilities your own cognitive um, capacity and I don't really think that that's what we're supposed to be thinking when thinking of the Trinity. I think it's supposed to be more formulated as one, such as how in the Cerberus analogy they do have one body. Going off of that, another downfall that I personally see within the social model is that anybody could leave at any time. So say it was three human persons of a family and the son was angry, he could leave and go become part of another family. He'd still be biologically in that family, 
yet they don't really mesh well into one. And I think that that's really the reason that I don't personally use the social model as my way of thinking about the Trinity. There are also some simpler analogies when we're looking at the Trinity and how to explain it. Although these simpler analogies have way too many downfalls to use and just don't really get the point across in a way that we can use these to fully think about and understand the Trinity. Um, But I do think they're worth considering just to make a little bit more sense and have some more um, input coming from other analogies. So the first of these simpler analogies is the water analogy. And basically it states that just as water can take three forms in a liquid and an ice and a vapor, um, God can take the form of the three divine persons. So God can choose to be the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit as he wants and pleases. Now the problem with this analogy is it affirms modalism. And what modalism basically says is that the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit are modes that God can go into um, versus them all being distinct divine persons that are God. It it kind of says how Superman can be Clark Kent or he can be Superman, something like that, um, that God can take the form of those superhero people um, whenever he wants to. But we know that that's wrong because the Trinity tells us that The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God themselves and together God. So another one of these simpler analogies would be the egg analogy. And just as an egg has three components to it, the shell, the yellow yolk in the middle, and the egg white, um, it tells us that basically God... Um, consists of these three components too. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit make up to be God. Now, the downfall with this one is the shell and the yolk and the egg white come together to make an egg. You can't have an egg without the shell or you can't have an egg without the egg white. But again, this this doesn't work with the the Trinity because we understand that this is suggesting that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are just parts that make up God. And that's not correct because, again, as we've stated multiple times, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are God. They don't come together to make God. So that would mean that God couldn't be basically part of this whole thing. Um because it's telling us that they're just parts, little parts that make up God, meaning that there are, I think that kind of tells us that one of the divine persons of the Trinity isn't equal to God. And that's just not something that we can use because it just goes way too far against what we're really trying to prove and look at within the doctrine of the Trinity. Alright, well with keeping those outside analogies in mind, I think I still come full circle um, back to the Cerberus analogy and that being the one that although there are multiple out there that I have not mentioned or discussed, the Cerberus analogy makes the most sense to me. And I think it's got a really powerful, powerful analogy happening with it. And although that that being said, there still are numerous objections that I would like to um, bring into the light. And of these numerous objections, one is from Daniel Howard Snyder. And what he basically says is that we just can't avoid polytheism with the Cerberus analogy. Polytheism means that there's more that there's more than one God. And we know that in the Christian tradition there is definitely not more than one God. There is one sole God who has three divine persons, as the Trinity states, and we only worship one God in the Christian tradition. So, with polytheism in mind, um, Snyder argues that 
it's Cerberus is not necessarily one dog that has three heads and three cognitive minds, um, but rather he's three dogs with overlapping bodies. And Snyder raises a very good point here, because if you're thinking about Siamese twins, um, so say a girl is born, has two heads, very rare, however could happen, um, you, they, they as well as you probably wouldn't think of them as one person with two heads. Perhaps you'd think of them as two people with one body, which might sound like it's the same thing, but I don't think it is. Because if that were to happen, I think the two girls would probably want to be individual people. And yes, although they make up one body and they make up um, one person, they still are two individual people because they'll have the, not their own physical capabilities, but they'll have their own cognitive abilities. And I think that will really push that they're individualistic. And so I could, I agree with Snyder that this is a huge thing that I don't think we can avoid. Something that I think is really important is having outsider's perspective. And although um, I've gathered information from philosophers and knowledgeable um, sources, I think people, um, everyday people who don't probably think about this a lot and some people that do think about this kind of stuff and do have their own opinions set in stone are really important to bring into this. So that's the next thing I would like to do. Um, so I'm going to have, I'm going to conduct an interview with a couple people and see what they think about all of this and where they stand on it. So first up, I'm here with Emily Keneally, who is a sophomore here at ISU and a special ed major. Emily, can you tell me a little bit about how much exposure you've had to Christian religion and its doctrines in the past, more specifically the doctrine of the Holy Trinity? I was raised a Catholic, and what I know about the Holy Trinity is that it is made up of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, that sounds good. So what do you think when you try and make sense of the Trinity and how in particular that there's three divine persons, yet there's only one God? I haven't really thought too much into it, I guess, but I know there's three different forms of the same God, like Jesus is the Son and the Holy Spirit is Jesus' ghost. <laughs> And the Father is the God that everyone thinks about when they think about God and Jesus. Okay, so actually, there's three main points of the Trinity, which is that there is only one God, and that there are three distinct divine persons within that God, as we spoke before, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then number three is that each of these persons are God. So, so actually, the way you were thinking of it isn't completely wrong. You had, like, the main idea, but um, they all equal God. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are on equal playing fields, and the Father's God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, just for a preface there. Um, a... Well known and probably to you not well known analogy to think about the Trinity and understand all of its components and and really the concept of it is the Cerberus analogy. What the Cerberus analogy tries to capture is that Cerberus is a mythical three headed dog that guards the gates of Hades. And with the doctrine of the Trinity, it's basically saying that just as God has three divine persons, but is indeed one God, it's the same as how Cerberus has three heads, but is still one dog. So I guess my question is, is do you think that this helps you make sense of the Trinity? And does this analogy help you 
further understand what it really could be about. This analogy definitely does make sense. As a Catholic and the way I was raised, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one God, but they didn't exist at the same time, which is kind of what that analogy makes me feel like. But I understand that like, if you weren't raised with a religion or just like myself as a Catholic, understanding that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, sorry, are all one, um, one God, the dog analogy does make sense. Yeah, and I think that's a really fair opinion to have and viewpoint on it. Okay, so do you see any issue with thinking of the Trinity in this way or with this analogy in general other than how they might not be all divine persons at the same time and prominent around the same time? This analogy makes sense when you're talking about how the Holy Trinity is all one God. But the question I definitely have is using this analogy kind of makes it seem like the three parts of the Holy Trinity are three parts that make up one God instead of all being the same God. Now I'm here with Michaela Stone King, who is a grad student at Illinois State studying psychology. So, Michaela, the Holy Trinity is the doctrine used by Christians that basically explains that there's three divine persons that are one God. So that's made up by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if I was explaining this to you, that the Trinity is like a Cerberus, and a Cerberus is a three-headed dog that guards Hades' gates in Greek mythology. Um, I make this connection because... Cerberus has three heads, but is one dog. So it's a popular analogy to put with the Trinity because the Trinity is made up of three divine persons, yet is still one God. So if I was making this connection, do you think that it would help or confuse you more when trying to understand the Trinity? I think this would help me because it's a good visual representation of what the Holy Trinity is because I'm not actually that familiar with the concept. Religion has never really been that a big part of my life, but I could see the connection between the dog and the Trinity. So yeah, I'd say it would probably help me. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, I really like the Cerberus analogy and I, I think it really has a strong argument. So one last question, would you have any other ways of thinking about the Trinity and its whole components and understanding it that would make more sense than the Cerberus analogy? Um, nothing really comes to mind, except maybe like a tree, you know, like how it has multiple branches, but it's one thing, so like the Trinity is all God, but like has three things that comprise it. Although the two student interviews that I conducted weren't with students that had a informational foreknowledge about what the Trinity was and all of its parts, and they had clearly not thought prior to my discussion with them about how to make sense of it. Which I think is actually really important to look at because most people don't. I know that before looking into all the documents and reading things, I hadn't ever really thought about it either. And I think a big thing is is that most people, Christian or not, don't take the time to understand that or do critical thinking about how that really would make sense. So although it wasn't a crazy amount that they had to say, I still find that it was super beneficial in understanding that with people who didn't actually have a complete idea of the Trinity and what they thought about it, they still both said that the Cerberus analogy would be a good generalized analogy to help make sense of the idea of the Trinity and how Three persons can be one, and how three heads can be one dog. Actually, and Emily had mentioned that 
she's a Catholic, and so she was saying that she thought the Cerberus analogy would be a good analogy, although the way she was raised was that the three divine persons of the Trinity were not around at the same time. So, per se, that the Holy Spirit was proceeding before the Father and the Son, or vice versa. So, that was different for me. I actually didn't know that, but it was still nice to know that there's different ways of looking at that kind of stuff, especially within the different denominations of Christianity. And even though she was raised that way, she still thought that the Cerberus analogy would be a good way to look at the way of the Trinity from an outsider point of view. I also actually got in contact with a pastor from my hometown who unfortunately was at conference when I was at home but still took the time to communicate with me over the telephone about a couple things. Um, I had basically asked him what his input on the Trinity and even mentioned the Cerberus analogy a little bit, just asking him what he had as an Christian expert, and he basically told me that there's always going to be ways to try and understand, um, to try and understand God, the mysteries of God, and that's all due to how unbelievable it may all seem. However, he had mentioned that that's kind of all part of it, and that the biggest thing is believing, although it doesn't make complete sense, because he had said on a couple occasions that it's really not supposed to. We try and make sense of it all and and we're really not supposed to because that's that's kind of where faith and devoted Christianity come in. Um, he also, when I had mentioned the Cerberus analogy and whether he thought that would be a good way to go about looking at it if there was to be an explanation, he never really mentioned whether it's a fair point or not and whether Christians should adopt that theory. However, he did mention briefly that it could be a way to lames terms it and use that to explain it to someone who, as I mentioned earlier, like the students I talked to, don't really have a foreknowledge about it. And I think that this was really beneficial to talk to him because although he didn't really give an argument for the Cerberus analogy or against it, it is a Christian's point of view and someone who is clearly very devoted to things like the Trinity and these doctrines and follows them very closely. And I'm very glad that I did end up getting somewhat of his insight, even if it wasn't towards the Cerberus analogy. So to start wrapping things up, I think I'd like to give some final thoughts on everything. Things I've read, the interviews that I've conducted, and my own thoughts and opinions that I've formulated throughout the process. I'd like to start off by saying that I still think the Cerberus analogy is one of the stronger analogies to be made when trying to understand the Holy Trinity. I know that there may be multiple oppositions and arguments as to why this analogy might suggest polytheism and other things because of the separate cognitive abilities of the Cerberus and of the divine persons. However, I don't think that this rules out this analogy, and I still think for me personally this analogy makes the most sense in trying to understand the Trinity. It doesn't matter if you're my pastor Tim from home, me who is was raised a Christian and knows the basic facts but has never really looked into things, or like Michaela who I interviewed that had really no religious background and no um, idea other than just what she's heard about the Trinity. I don't think any of that really matters when you're when you're looking at this kind of thing. I think the Cerberus analogy would serve a good purpose for anybody trying to explain how three divine beings can be one. That's a hard concept to grasp, to understand, and to even believe no matter who you are. And I think despite the oppositions we heard from Snyder, um, how there's multiple ways to think about it, and how, as Pastor Tim had said, 
that there's so much more to the Trinity and believing and Christian theology anyway, that there probably isn't one specific concrete way to think about things. However, if I was going to explain to a third party how how can three divine persons be one God and how can that be true? How can that happen? I don't know the answers to it all. I'm not God. I'm not an expert. But I think that I would use the Cerberus analogy to help explain how three can be one. Like a three-headed dog can be one dog. And three divine persons can still be one God. I think this is very beneficial. I will fight for this analogy. And I hope that I have done a good job trying to explain the Cerberus analogy, how it relates to the Trinity, explaining the Trinity and its parts, and I have furthered your interest and knowledge in the topic overall, and I would like to appreciate my gratitude for you listening. I will finally leave you with a Bible quote that I think overall wraps up the Trinity and the idea of it really well, and this is 1 John 5, 7. And it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one.